Uh, welcome to the second lecture in this year's Ulam Lecture Series. Many of you will know that uh, these lectures sponsored by the Institute are dedicated to the memory of Stanislav Ulam. He was one of the truly gifted scientists in the Manhattan Project over at Los Alamos after the, during and after the war, but also a friend to many of the founders of the Santa Fe Institute. I didn't know Stan Ulam personally, but by reputation among his friends and colleagues, he was greatly admired as not only a tremendous intellect in the areas of his own specialization, but somebody who was broadly interested in science and willing to pursue seriously the entire range of his interests. So it was felt that he personally represented the spirit of scientific inquiry that was the purpose for founding the Santa Fe Institute. And so it's a special privilege that we get to give you this extended lecture series each year. I want to thank again Penelope Penland for supporting underwriting this year's lecture series. Uh, Penelope. <laughs> has been a longstanding friend to the Institute and to many of us there. Before introducing tonight's speaker, I wanted to mention that the next Santa Fe public lecture is the first time we break from our usual Wednesday night schedule. So that will be here, but it will be Tuesday, October 7th. Uh, speaker will be Franz Deval talking about our inner ape, and it should be fun. So I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to introduce Sam Bowles as our speaker to you tonight. I met Sam about five years ago at the kickoff meeting of the Behavioral Sciences Program at the Santa Fe Institute. And I was struck immediately by two things. I had come from a somewhat narrow background in physics where we didn't ask most interesting questions. And I was amazed that you could try scientifically to ask questions at this interface of economy and society, behavior, cognition. And I was equally impressed with the clarity and lucidity of the guy in the center who seemed to be holding it all together. But the other thing that struck me was the way Sam and his colleagues actively worked to include me in the group meetings, the workshops, for years. And I have no doubt this was a great cost to them in time and patience, but it was a great benefit to me. So it seems fitting somehow that Sam talks to us about altruism at this series of lectures. Jeffrey gave Sam a good introduction last night and kind of emphasized the person of enormous energy and sort of boundless optimism that we all have experienced. So I'll only uh, highlight a couple of things for those of you who may be coming for the first time tonight. Sam is, of course, a professor at the Santa Fe Institute and the director of the Behavioral Sciences Program, also a professor at the University of Siena. His education was first at Yale and then at Harvard, and his PhD was in economics. And then he taught at Harvard for, I guess, eight years, and then about three decades at the UMass Amherst, sort of a group of renegade professors who were out to reform economics and the social sciences, uh, with the results much of what you will see tonight. In addition to his academic credentials, he spent a lot of time in serious policy advice. Jeffrey mentioned the Robert Kennedy candidacy, but Sam also advised the Jesse Jackson candidacy. Uh, in addition to providing advice to the Mandela government in South Africa, he's advised the governments of Greece and Cuba, which is a remarkable story by any account from which there's still lots to be learned, uh, the World Bank, and a variety of international labor organizations. Sam has been either author or editor of eight books, one of which recently is a big introductory textbook in economics. Some of them are about properties of individuals, things like moral sensibilities or altruistic behavior. Others have to do with system effects, so persistent inequality, poverty traps, the effects of globalization, or the problems of environmental sustainability. And it's this broad range of topics all sort of informing each other that Sam and his colleagues bring to the Santa Fe Institute through the Behavioral Sciences Program. And there's another book due out with Gerb, uh, Herb Gintis, I think, to be finished this year, which will be drawing together a lot of these ideas that have been built piecemeal over the years. So when we, when we look at the lectures, it's striking the magnitude of what Sam and colleagues are trying to do. They're trying to reform economics and put it onto a solid foundation with the rest of the behavioral sciences. I remember either at a meeting or at informal talks some years ago, you were telling us about going to Nigeria to teach school, thinking that when there's something missing in opportunity, what you do is go fill the opportunity, and then finding these attempts at local solutions thwarted by global failures. So problems of ethnic and language boundaries that get made even more fractious by religious divisions, and thinking, okay, 
the ability to see the big picture of these systems is what economics should be giving us, but it doesn't because it has such an unreal and unnatural picture of humans and human behavior. So we saw in last night's lecture some of the problems with that picture, the sort of ruthless analyzer and player of games who has only a very narrow notion of self-interest. Uh, Sam was able to show the ways in which if you try to understand the cooperative behavior that are part of all of our lives, this paradigm falls flat. Now there were important ideas for how to try to make cooperative behavior understandable without giving up the paradigm. But the real jewel of last night was that there's such overwhelming behavioral evidence that it's just the wrong way to ask these questions. So what Sam and colleagues are doing as the sort of Sistine Chapel picture is to try to embed human choices and human motivations in brains and bodies that live in the society and that live in history which is tremendously ambitious and very difficult. Now, a lot of the things that have been learned in the choice framework are still gonna be useful and a lot of the problems that were there are not gonna go away because choices still had to be made. Maybe they were made by social selection or by biological selection. Maybe they're recorded in genes or in culture. But those lessons still have to be learned and they, the solutions still have to be understood. The thing that's impressive though is that if we can get the richness of these many layers of description together, maybe there's a chance we can do it right this time, that we can ask the questions in the right way and get answers to them that have something of the confidence that we expect from a scientific discipline. So super hard, very interesting questions, of course vitally important, never more than now. And I'm very eager to hear part two. Sam? Thank you all for coming. Thank you for your interest in these important topics. I look forward to your comments and your questions. You see on the screen before you uh, a rock painting in the Drakensberg Mountains in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, a place where I have spent a lot of time camping and hiking. Uh, this is a picture of what some part of the economy of our ancestors may have looked like. Um, and uh, I will be going back at least that far to try to understand how we became the cooperative species that we are. But I want to review a little bit. Uh, uh, yesterday I made the point that we are a uniquely cooperative species uh, uh, in the ways that we cooperate. Other species cooperate, but we cooperate in distinct ways. Um, I also uh, advanced the idea that important aspects of cooperation can't be explained by self-interest with a long time horizon or any of the other variants of the somebody may be looking uh, paradigm. Um, I further said that there's a, a sufficient evidence to think that part of the explanation for this is that many of us, much of the time, are altruistic in a way which I defined. And today, the much harder task uh, is to try to figure out how did we get to have brains and bodies that act this way, given all of the way that the deck is stacked against an altruistic gene or an altruistic person, uh, surviving and prospering. This is based on a bunch of papers, some of which, by the way, are outside. Oh, and this reminds me, I will provide tomorrow evening uh, uh, copies of the slides, uh, of the, that is of the first and second and third lectures. Uh, some of you who have asked for that and we were unable to get them copied at the last minute today, but you can certainly get copies. I do not post these on my webpage because uh, essentially, my lectures change all the time, and uh, so I, I don't encourage the circulating them widely simply because they're always uh, in, in motion. Uh, but I'm very happy if you want to have them. It may help you uh, connect what I said in the previous lectures. Uh, much of this work is ongoing. Uh, Eric's very nice introduction uh, did stress, uh, and colleagues, um, at the end I'll come back to the very large number of people uh, who are responsible for this work. Uh, it being interdisciplinary and touching on the topics you see before you in the screen, in, including this very nice new term, paleoeconomics, uh, I suppose that's what you're going to get. Um, in the, um, uh, I will try to connect these things, but the idea that I have is really a simple one. These are uh, Kung uh, in uh, Botswana, uh, and that rather large former ungulate uh, will be shared with a very large number of people, far greater than this group here. Um, I want to argue, however, that this kind of sharing 
on a large scale, which characterizes all human societies, including our own, is connected to this. This is warfare in Irian Jaya, in, uh, uh, and um, uh, it's the connection between these two things that I think is really crucial to understanding how we came to be the cooperative species that we are and the kind of cooperative species that we are. Now this guy here, see that those guys are fighting these guys and this guy here is way ahead of his group. Now, you wouldn't really say that that guy was maximizing his fitness. <laughs> and indeed, he wasn't maximizing his fitness. Um, so this is about fighting and food and fitness. Don't continue that. There are many jokes in biology about what it's all about. Um, the, um, uh, I want to start uh, with an old debate, which will be familiar to all of you. If you don't know the names, you probably do know the names. Everyone has had this debate, usually late at night during your freshman or sophomore year. Uh, Peter Kropotkin, a uh, Russian, uh, um, uh, proposed the idea in a book by that name that mutual aid was an intrinsic characteristic not only of humans but of many animals as well. Uh, Thomas Huxley, uh, an opponent uh, of Kropotkin in many debates actually, uh, stressed that uh, evolution and nature was red in tooth and claw. Uh, these two apparently emphasizing contrasting and conflicting and inconsistent viewpoints about the nature of human nature. Uh, but I'd like to begin with a view which you will see immediately, perhaps combines the two. Darwin in The Descent of Man wrote, selfish and, and contentious people will not cohere, and without coherence nothing can be effected. A tribe possessing a greater number of courageous, sympathetic, and faithful members who are always ready to warn each other of danger, to aid and defend each other, would spread and be victorious over other tribes. Thus, the social and moral qualities would tend slowly to advance and be diffused throughout the world. Um, now, um, so the idea here, I guess, is that we engage in mutual aid because evolution is red in tooth and claw. It's basically a conflictual theory of the evolution of these things which we find so admirable when we treat members of our group with respect and generosity. So, this is the theme which I'd like to place before you. Did we come to have things like the icon of cooperation, the barn raising, because we also did this? Now, I want to explain to you in the way we now do uh, computer simulations, Darwin's idea. So let's start. Um, we have two types of individuals. We have altruists who are called A's. And we have uh, those who are not altruists, they're defectors. They're called D's here, but they're called N's there. Sorry about that. And we start off with a group here composed of some individuals. And you see there's some pairings. Uh, the, um, uh, we have some, some defectors paired with defectors, some altruists paired with altruists, and some mixed. They're paired to do some activity. Uh, they, uh, we may say they're randomly paired. Uh, and then they get some payoffs out of that interaction. That is, they benefit or lose in some way. And they're, that's in the second thing here. They have certain amounts of payoffs depending on who they got paired with and what their activities were. When I say altruist and defector, you can think of the prisoner's dilemma if you want, but it's much more generic than that. Uh, and they then reproduce. Uh, and so we have here a new society, and the important thing to notice is uh, there used to be four altruists and now there are three. Well, that's obvious because the defectors are clearly going to do better than the altruist by the definition of altruism, which is paying a cost to help someone else. Um, now, then some of the, re then in, in this reproduction process, some actually mutate, a very small number, obviously, and uh, then some migrate to other groups. Uh, so uh, here we have some emigrating, here we have some coming in. And the crucial thing, the red in tooth and claw part, is that they run into this group here, perhaps competing for some physical or reproductive resources. Uh, and the winning group uh, is the group that has more altruists, because they'll cooperate in the defense of the group, as Darwin said, warming, warning of danger and so on. So this group is eliminated. Perhaps its site is taken, 
and the winning group repopulates it, this group now too large to be governed by the kind of forager government, which is by consensus in small groups, it then divides randomly, uh, and then you have two other groups. Uh, and then these two groups start at the top. This is actually a description of a computer program that we used. I'll show you the result much later on. Uh, the, um, now, if you haven't studied biology, it sounds like a good idea. It sounds like it might work, right? Now, I had the great advantage that when I started working on group selection problems uh, about uh, uh, 20 years ago, I hadn't studied biology. So I didn't know that it was a dumb idea. Uh, the, um, this whole framework is called group selection. Now, I studied economics, and I know that if somebody says that free trade is a bad idea, then you know they haven't studied economics. Right? It's a sure test. They just don't understand the first thing. In biology, it works the same way. If you think group selection works, well, it just means you've never been in a biology course, because obviously it can't work. So, Somehow, this idea, which sounded sort of reasonable with Darwin, and it looks reasonable here, got sent to the doghouse. Um, it's called group selection, usually with a, with a sneer. Uh, and about 40 years ago, it was set to rest in a very influential book. And it was thought to be unworkable, because for genetically transmitted traits, it requires the two things. These victorious tribes would have to be very different genetically from the losers to make this a powerful force. Uh, and these encounters between the tribes would have to be frequent enough so that the encounters in which the altruists can actually increase their numbers in the population uh, would happen frequently enough to offset the fact that they're losing all the time in the reproduction process within the groups. Now, the first was thought to be, this point here, the differences among groups were thought to be small. Uh, because there's a lot of migration. Most animals move from group to group, and humans are no, no different. Uh, and the second um, encountered some resistance, that is, the idea that these, these tribal warfare was frequent, encountered resistance from people who had the idea that our ancestors actually were rather peaceful uh, uh, people. Um, now, it should be said that the criticism of group selection was not aimed primarily at humans. And many great bi biologists, uh, like Haldane, for example, speculated that it could very well work for humans, and Hamilton as well. Uh, the argument was that for most animals it doesn't work because the groups won't be different enough, because there's too much migration, so-called gene flow, between groups. Uh, now, today, those of you who weren't here yesterday means that this is a hot topic. And uh, I... Um, uh, it's the, the, it's the doghouse, by the way. The doghouse is a hot topic. Whether or not group selection should be in the doghouse, uh, a number of very influential biologists have always thought that the argument was actually uh, quite a plausible one. Uh, a number of people associated with the Santa Fe Institute, like Mark Feldman and others, and uh, Robert Boyd and others, have proposed that it actually could work uh, for, for humans. Uh, and in recent years, E.O. Wilson, one of the, of course, most prominent biologists in the United States, has taken up the uh, argument that, well, yes, it really might work. Um, now, but I want to explain why it is thought not to work first. Uh, we're going to start with the prisoner's dilemma, which um, we uh, introduced la yesterday. I think it's probably familiar to most of you, but just to review. Uh, there's an altruistic behavior the individual can engage in. It costs C. C is denominated either in material goods or in, uh, in fitness units. It depends on what kind of a model you're doing. Uh, this action, which costs C, confers a benefit B on a randomly paired single member of the group. Uh, and so we conclude from that that a, a group which is composed entirely of altruists would get B minus C, that is, uh, in every case, there'd be an A match with an A, and this is the payoff to the row guy. That's the payoff if you're a, a non-altruist and you get matched with an A guy. You get B, but you don't pay the cost. Uh, now, um, it's, well, the crucial thing about this is that uh, the individual, the N, who defects, gets a higher payoff no matter what the other guy does. 
Uh, and that's what I called uh, last night a dominant strategy. It's independent of what the other guy does. Now, so this is basically the game which has provided, it's kind of the workhorse of this, of this literature. Uh, either, uh, well, there are other workhorses too, but this is one of the ones. Now, a little warning here, there's going to be a little heavy lifting for the next couple of slides, because I want to know, show why this dooms altruism, because we have to understand that clearly in order to understand why it might not be doomed. So, we now turn to the evolutionary fate, namely doom, of an altruistic trait. Um, now, I define this term here, this means the probability of being paired with an altruist, conditional on your being an altruist, and that's the probability of being paired with an altruist, conditional on you being a not-altruist. Uh, now, obviously, if you have a large population and you just randomly pair people, those two numbers are going to be the same. Everybody's going to have the same probability. Uh, now, uh, so, if you have random pairing, then it turns out that the, the payoff to the altruist will be less than the payoff to the non-altruist, and it doesn't matter how many altruists there are in the group. This line here is the payoff to the non-altruist. This here is the payoff uh, to the altruist. Now, so, for example, here, there are no altruists in the group, and so the defector gets zero. But over here, the group is entirely altruist except him, and he gets B, obviously. Uh, but the crucial point is these two lines, this line is always above that line, so it doesn't matter where you are along here, you can be zero altruist or you can be all altruist, and the altruists will be uh, suffering the disadvantage, which is the vertical distance between these two lines. So, if I, gosh, I should have done this. Uh, suppose I wanted to give you the, the, the idea of this as a dynamical system, I just would have put arrows along here going in that direction. So wherever you are, if evolutionary pressures are pushing you over to the left towards zero altruism. And that is the fate. Now, suppose you don't have this large population scenario. Suppose you have a population in little groups, like our ancestors, groups of maybe 10 or 15 adults in a group. Uh, then you have another possibility, because the, uh, if you have a lot of groups, just statistically, by chance, some groups will have a lot of A's, and some groups will have a lot of N's. And if you take it the next step, most of the A's will be in groups which have a majority of A's. And most of the N's will be in a group with a majority of N's. And you can see immediately where this is going. Then it will turn out that the probability of being matched with an A, given that you're an A, will be greater than the average in the whole population, and greater than the probability of getting to match with an A and exploit the A if you're an N. So the doom scenario can break down if the groups are different enough. Now, this number here, the difference between these two conditional probabilities, that's that minus that, in this graph here, that tells you how different the groups would have to be in order for them to make the same payoffs. Notice, the A's, in this, in this population, the A's are likely to meet another A with this probability, they get that payoff there. The N's are likely to meet an A with that probability, and they get that payoff there. Now, I just drew it so they happen to have equal payoffs. Uh, obviously, if the groups are even more different than that, then the A's would have higher payoffs. And if they're less different, then the A's would have lower payoffs. So you see where this is going. The more different the groups are, with respect to the fraction of altruists in them, the better it's going to be for the altruists. So, out of the doghouse? I think so, uh, at least for humans. Uh, there's a lot of recent evidence, much of it collected by people working at the Santa Fe Institute and others who are my collaborators uh, in, outside in the rest of the world. Uh, a lot of recent evidence suggests two things, that our foraging ancestors lived in genetically differentiated groups which were also warlike. Uh, so there was a lot of conflicts and they were really different, uh, and moreover, they adopted practices which were likely to make uh, Darwin's account work, uh, slowing down the process of selection against the altruists within their groups. I'll explain what those are. Now, I can't survey all the evidence. I'll give you some pictures of what, what we now have. But uh, just to give you a taste, uh, this involved, start with obviously, population genetics. We had to get genetic material from a large number of uh, populations and study that and figure out how different groups were. 
We had to obviously look at a lot of anthropological accounts of how people interacted in foraging societies, contemporary ones or those in the historical record. Uh, the archaeology came in and figuring out how common war, uh, wars were, looking at smashed skulls and broken ulnas uh, and trying to figure out how many people died as a result of clashes. Climatology came in, as you'll see. And in looking at these, we had to do things like looking at skeletal remains, uh, looking at gene genetic markers. We use extensively computer simulations, ethnography, and so on. So this is a massive project involving a very large number of people with obviously a very diverse set of skills, and you'll see how we tried to pull it uh, together. I'll begin with the evolutionary modeling, because I want to say a bit more about how the doom scenario maybe isn't uh, inevitable. Uh, now, this new evidence here is as I say, it's mostly published in top journals, so that's good, but that doesn't mean it's not controversial. It just means that some referees have said it's worth thinking about, and uh, I expect uh, a lot of uh, new data and uh, critical uh, analysis of the work that our group has done, and uh, perhaps this will turn out to be not as we now think it, um, it is. Um, now, how humans may have escaped the evolutionary fate of an altruistic trait, uh, is that our groups may have been very different one from another. That is, this distance between the groups, uh, between the conditional probabilities, may have been a lot. That's called in biology positive assortment. That is, you're more likely to meet someone like yourself. We usually talk about positive assortment in mating, but obviously any group differences can be described that way. Positive assortment is just measured by the difference in a conditional probability of meeting a type to the extent that it depends on your own type as opposed to being independent of that. Now, um, this is not um, rocket science, but if you look at this graph here, how far apart do those two things have to be in order for the altruist to do as well as the non-altruist? Well, it turns out that this distance from here to here is equal to the ratio of the cost to the benefits of the altruistic trait. Now we're getting somewhere, because now we know how different they have to be. If they're very different, uh, then the, uh, um, the evolutionary process will support a very costly form of altruism. Uh, if they're not very different, then the, the amount of the costliness of the altruistic trait, which will be supported by natural selection, will be very limited. Um, now, those who put group selection in the doghouse for animals in general, but it was applied to humans, they believed that the group genetic differences, this thing here, the, dif the difference between these two conditional probabilities, was much too small, possibly on the order of 0.02. That's a teeny, teeny difference in groups. Uh, and uh, uh, that's what Sewell Wright, that's what he speculated, human groups might be that different. Now, you don't have to think too hard to realize that if the differences are just 0.02, uh, then the benefits would have to be 50 times the cost. In other words, C over B would have to be 0.02 in order for, the, for altruism to be able to survive. Now, others thought that B over C uh, would also be quite small. That is, uh, it might be the benefits to twice, twice the cost or four times the cost, but nothing like 50. I mean, it, so that seemed to be basically spell the fate, the doom fate. Now, what we know is that group selection, or sometimes multi-level selection, uh, is it's obviously a horse race. It's a race between what goes on within the group, which is the altruists are always losing in every single group, their fraction is declining. That's one horse. The other horse is occasionally the groups meet and the groups with more altruists win, and that way altruism can spread. Which one is the more powerful, which one is working more quickly, is going to determine uh, which uh, horse wins. Obviously, most biologists thought that the within-group horse would win, um, and I think that maybe for humans, that, was, that answer was wrong. Now, among us, perhaps uniquely, uh, we proved to be extremely good at both uh, raising the group benefits of altruism, that is, ra getting a high B, and we also proved very good at having our groups be quite different, one from another, by various kinds of boundary maintenance, which will become an important part of the later part of this lecture. Uh, and we also did things that lowered C. 
all of which I'll describe to you in just a minute. So this kind of gave Darwin's idea a chance. Okay, the good news is, how do we lower C? Well, we lower C by adopting practices like monogamy and sharing food so that the people who are doing relatively well in the group, that is the ones who are not the altruists, they can't get too much. For example, suppose that it's a hunting society and some hunters help other hunters and other people just get as much as they can. Now, if they take it home and the selfish ones eat what they got and the altruists eat what they got, you'll have a reproductive difference or at least a material difference between those. But suppose, as in many foraging societies, something else happens. Some fraction of the food is put into a common pot and shared equally, and the rest of it is taken home. Well, that's like the welfare state, just like a tax, right? Uh, uh, some part is being shared generally, and that reduces the difference in the payoff between the non-altruists and the altruists, thereby lowering the cost of being an altruist. Monogamy, likewise, makes it more difficult for dominant males to monopolize reproduction, thereby essentially just reducing the stakes of the game within the group and slowing down the process whereby altruists will be selected against. Now, I suppose this is bad news. The thing that really raises B, and the thing that really raises this difference in group composition, is that we have characteristics of human societies, not all of them, but many of them, is hostility towards outsiders, uh, and frequent warfare. Frequent warfare made the benefits of having altruists in your group gigantic because if you didn't survive one of those conflicts, you're all likely to die. That is a very, very big fitness consequence. And the sometimes hostility, or what we now would call xenophobia, uh, uh, would make uh, this difference in these groups rather substantial. Now, I think and I think I've shown in the papers that I mentioned, that the combination of these two things, operating at levels which we can estimate probably occurred during the last 100,000 years prior to the development of agriculture, 10,000, 8,000 years ago, uh, those things could have conveyed, could have been a force large enough to make altruism uh, successful. Uh, the examples that I gave are reproductive and material leveling, that reduces payoffs within groups, uh, and that obviously means that if you have a bunch of altruists in the group, they will still be in the process of being eliminated, but it'll be much slower. So you'll retain your altruists longer. Therefore, you might actually win one of those battles. Um, now, we know that these leveling practices are common among uh, ethnographic foragers, and we think it's quite likely they were common among our ancestors. Um, now, the interesting point here is that suppose you have some groups adopting leveling practices, slowing down the selection against the altruists, and you have some other groups who don't. Well, the groups with the leveling practices will end up, at any given time, with more altruists in them. And so those groups, the levelers, are more likely to win the contest. Your first thought is, oh, that's going to allow the altruists to proliferate. That's true. And what else? That makes leveling proliferate, because the new societies which they form on the sites of the eliminated individuals will, of course, with high likelihood, adopt the same culture and institutions that they have. So now, now we're talking about a dual evolutionary process in which, as Eric said in his introduction, we have selection going on about the individuals which type of individual is going to survive, but we're also selecting groups for the kinds of institutions that they have. And the process by which altruism may have succeeded is also a process which would have promoted the spread of leveling as a characteristic of forager society, perhaps accounting for the very, quite striking degree of egalitarianism among our ancestors. Another way of looking at this is these leveling institutions might be called a niche. Niche construction is a very interesting topic now in biology. Many animals create environments which affect the evolution of their gene uh, distribution of genes. And something like leveling, mating practices, sharing food is just another example of a kind of a niche. Uh, now, here's the same figure as before. Remember, I said that sharing the meat in the common pot was like the welfare state. OK, well, here's the tax rate here. Uh, that's the fraction that goes into the common pot. 
I, what I've done here is I've taken exactly the same graph with exactly the same payoffs and I've modified them. Now, the selfish guy in the population of all altruists, he doesn't get B, he gets B minus C times T. That's, he pays those taxes. And, uh, so the blue lines now represent the expected payoffs of these individuals. Well, you still have the same problem. The altruists are still losing, but notice, the groups uh, don't have to be as different as they were before. Uh, they have to be only this different as opposed to that different. In other words, what leveling does is it gives group selection a helping hand by slowing down the selection within each group. These ideas have been common in biology for a long time. Uh, they were uh, applied in, uh, for human societies initially by Chris Bohm. Where are you, Chris? Where's Chris Bohm? Chris Bohm is hiding up in the back. He's a, a brilliant uh, anthropologist. He really began a lot of these ideas. Uh, and he's a resident of Santa Fe and a professor at USC. Um, uh, so let me give this, uh, this to you in the words of Steve Frank, also a, a faculty member at the Santa Fe. Steve, are you here? Steve was here last night. Uh, here's what Steve wrote. He was, this is a paper about slime mold, but uh, it might have been, it's kind of a preface to what I'm saying. Evolutionary theory has not explained how competition among lower level units is suppressed in the formation of higher level evolutionary units. Mutual policing and enforcement of reproductive fairness are also required for the evolution of increasing social complexity. So this is far from a new idea, it's just applying those ideas of uh, what's called variance reduction, technically, to uh, the human species. There are some economists here, and I'm sure you're noticing what I've just said. The suppression of competition, not competition itself, is the key to the evolutionary success of a group in this case. Now, uh, the story I've told you is called coevolution, the coevolution of individual behavior and group level institutions. Um, the synergy, which I said, uh, operates between uh, reducing the costs uh, of altruism and leveling is, I think, a part of the story, but of course there has to be more, th more than the story. There's more than that to the story. Frequent warfare increasing the benefits of having altruism in your group, or rather, <laughs> increasing the costs of not having them, and hostility towards outsiders, spreading out the differences among groups. Now, um, we have a problem. Uh, doing paleo anything is really fun. It's like reading great literature, because sometimes you can't really figure out what's happening, and so you can kind of interpret. Uh, now, as a scientist, of course, I find this deeply frustrating because we're, we're asking really hard questions. We're asking a causal question about why something happened. We know it happened, but we're asking why it happened. That's hard. Um, the process we're investigating is far too complex for mathematical modeling alone to be illuminating. That is, it can be modeled, but it's very difficult to extract uh, sufficient answers from those models. Uh, we use agent, uh, and of course, by the way, what's obvious is we have a, you'll see how limited the information is, the kind of inferences we can make about what was happening 50,000 years ago among people who left very few traces, right? These are not builders of monuments and so on. These are hunters and gatherers. Um, now, like the experiments that I discussed yesterday, agent-based modeling allows us independently to vary influences on behavior while holding constant other things. It allows us to do hypothetical thinking. What would have happened if the groups had been a little smaller, a little larger? What would have happened if migratory patterns had been different? So, um, this allow it's almost like uh, hypothetical history is what I call it, but we're allowed to do experiments with a historical process once we're reasonably convinced that we have a model which is replicating the things that we do know about the historical process. Um, now, you could start, for example, by saying, well, okay, suppose I propose this idea that warfare is crucial, so let's make a model of early human society. By, uh, what I mean is from, say, 100,000 years ago to maybe 10,000 years ago, uh, and then see if you just arbitrarily vary the frequency of war, what kind of difference does it make? Well, here's, here's a result of some simulations, a very large number of them. Each point here, that's 10 runs of 50,000 generations. Uh, and we 
Here we have the probability that a conflict happens between groups. So in every period, uh, groups with some probability are identified. You're going to have a war, and then they're paired randomly. Uh, and here we have the fraction of altruists that results in the, long, in the very long run of that society. And uh, the blue line is when we don't allow them to share resources. We just turn that off. This is one of the, it's great, isn't it? You can play God with history. Just say, suppose they couldn't do food sharing. Uh, then, um, uh, so T is arbitrarily set to zero. And then what you, you can interpret this in the following way. Suppose that um, uh, with 25% probability, this is a percent, uh, you're going to have a war. So one war every four generations, roughly. In that situation, you'll get roughly 70% 70, 70 uh, uh, altruists in the population in the long run. Once you allow food sharing to take place, I set aside monogamy, you get a very different picture. It takes much less war to generate a lot of altruists, uh, uh, to generate a lot of altruism. That's because you've turned down the dial on the within group selection. How do I model that sharing thing? Okay, well I say, I first randomly give every group a practice. They can, they can share 1%, they can share 90%, whatever. However, uh, if they meet a group and lose a war, the site on which the losing group used to be takes over the sharing practices of the winning group. So it's kind of cultural imperialism, if you want. Uh, and in every period, groups kind of experiment, or they may experiment with some probability, moving their sharing a little bit in one direction or the other. So that's how I modeled that. And um, the basic idea is that if you allow sharing, you can see you get a lot more altruism for every frequency of war. Or another way of putting it is, suppose you're interested in, in having a population of half altruists. Well, that takes here, you know, a 13% probability of having war if you allow food sharing to evolve, and it takes a lot more war otherwise. So this, this convinced uh, my co-authors and me that we were onto something, that basically warfare was having a really powerful effect. But... Uh, but it was cheating, right? Because <laughs> we can't just assume that war happens. War is one of the things we'd like to explain. After all, I mean, man many animals have what we might call wars. Uh, there are boundary skirmishes among chimps. Meerkats have wars in which substantial number of the animals die. Uh, fire ants do the same thing. Uh, by the way, with, in some cases with mortality, not terribly different from humans, but there, there are, uh, so there are other species that do have warfare, and we'd well like to explain why it is that we're so particularly adept at it. So we need to expand on Darwin's idea, and I amend it here. Well, do we engage in mutual aid because evolution is red in tooth and claw? The simulations I just showed you, I think, perhaps will convince you that yes, that is true. Uh, but the second thing is also possible. Is our evolution red in tooth and claw because we engage in mutual aid? That is, is war a frequent matter in human society in part because we are altruistic? Okay, I, did I lose you on that? I know, it's a very, a very unsettling thought. Well, okay, here's the idea. You can't have a decent war without altruists, right? Because nobody will fight. Everybody say, after you, right? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, uh, the, the fact that we have extraordinary, lethal wars probably has something to do with the fact that we're altruistic animals. Um, now, that's hard, however, because how could we become this hostile, or what I call parochial, just because I think it's kind of fancy. Uh, how, we became altruists with a parochial bent. How could that be? Parochialism, by which I mean favoring ethnic, racial, or other insiders over outsiders, and altruism, they're very commonly observed, sometimes in experiments and in natural settings. It's far from universal, I'll come back to that at the end. The parochials bear costs. They forego beneficial interactions with outsiders. They don't like them, they don't like to deal with them. They don't want to exchange with them. They don't want to share food with them. They don't want to co-insure. They have a limited scope because of their narrow minds. So parochial altruism is puzzling because both parochialism and altruism reduce the 
actor's payoffs by comparison to somebody who was tolerant and non-parochial. The idea that my group wanted to explore is this. We wondered if maybe parochialism and altruism alone couldn't make it. They would indeed be doomed, but they could evolve together, each providing the conditions for the other to survive. Uh, that's a coevolutionary process now, not between institutions and individual traits, but this is a coevolutionary co process between two types of human behavior, or as I'll model it, between uh, genes at two different loci. Um, so we're going we're gonna to try to model this population. We have a population in which individuals may be either altruistic or not, that's that dimension, and they can be either parochial or tolerant. That's not a payoff matrix, it's just a characterization of the types in the population. There are four types, parochial, altruist, tolerant, etc. Now, uh, these are behaviors, they're not the, the preferences that motivate them. Uh, the, uh, I'm here looking at behaviors which would succeed without asking what it is, what's the psychological underpinning which would get people to act that way. Okay, the A's contribute to the fitness of other group members. But only the PAs, the parochial altruists, will fight wars. You have to be both an altruist and hostile towards outsiders to be willing to kill them. The uh, parochials induce hostilities, and they also forego the benefits of peaceful interactions with other groups, which are enjoyed by the T's. And so you can see that in every group, the tolerant ones beat the parochials. Uh, because the tolerant ones can access all these other people in the surrounding groups and the, and the parochials can't. But the knots are going to beat the altruists for the familiar reason that we explored yesterday, namely by the definition of altruism, the altruists are giving away fitness to the knots. Now the key point here is that to be a not altruistic tolerant is the dominant strategy. Remember what that means. That's the highest payoff thing to do independently of what other people are doing. That's the highest payoff thing to do in the group. So if that's all that was happening, if we didn't have anything else going on, just a single group constructed this way, the group would be composed entirely of tolerant uh, and non-altruistic people. And we'll see, there's a lot of evolutionary forces which will create that. However, war to the rescue. I didn't mention that if the groups got into war, then having some parochial altruist in your group can save your life. Uh, so, he, he, so we have these two processes. Within the group, we have what's called a public goods game with benefits B and a cost C, the same thing you had before. This is some other group over here, same thing going on inside it. But between the groups, they may either have a hostile conflict or they may have trade insurance and they may be able to exploit the benefits of peaceful coexistence. Uh, and we want to then model how this thing adds up uh, in terms of evolutionary processes. We know what's going on here. The altruists are going to be eliminated and the parochials are going to be eliminated. But when the war has happened between the groups, the groups with a lot of parochial altruists will have uh, an advantage. Um, I assume that the behaviors are transmitted vertically, that is from parents to offspring. It could be cultural, it could be genetic. I use a genetic metaphor here talking about um, uh, different alleles at two loci, but it, it doesn't matter. It could just be could, things that you get from your parents as opposed to from anybody else. Now, this is a story about what might have happened. And I'll turn to our, trying, our attempts to simulate this. But what I always do before I simulate anything, before I write down any game theoretic uh, equations or, or um, dynamical systems, I try to ask, well, what is the thing in the world that I'm trying to understand? What do we know about that? Does the model describe our ancestral past? I'm going to embarrass Chris Bohm by quoting him again. Towards the end of the Pleistocene, as anatomically modern humans began to emerge, group extinction rates could have risen dramatically as needy bands of well-armed hunters, strangers lacking established patterns of political interaction, frequently collided, either locally or in the course of long-distance migration. Um, that's the ulna that I mentioned. Uh, that's the outside bone in your arm. A fracture in the left ulna is often interpreted as a uh, defense against a right-handed uh, attacker. Uh, if you see the outside being broken a lot in burials, that's 
indicate, that's, that's a likely indication that you've had some conflict. If you see the radius uh, broken, that's probably you fell off a tree or something. Um, now, the strength of Chris Bohm's assessment of that is greatly enhanced by recent data about climate. This is um, uh, 90,000 years ago. This is the, what's called the Holocene. This is when agriculture starts. I'm interested in this period here. Geologists are very perverse. They like to put things in the you know, distant past over here and the present over here. That's just because that's one of the tribal things that they do. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, the, um, this um, this uh, oxygen isotope signature uh, scales with uh, surface uh, with, with uh, surface centigrade temperatures. We so we have recent data; we can compare them. Uh, so these differences here are a difference of about 10 degrees centigrade. Okay, please look at that carefully. 10 degrees centigrade over what period of time? Maybe 100 years, 200 years. Do you know what we're freaking out about right now? What is it? One and a half, something like that. Uh, you know what the little ice age was that devastated Europe? That was a fall in temperature of two degrees centigrade. Or put it this way, suppose you're an animal that lives in a certain kind of uh, environment and you hunt certain kinds of anim uh, other animals and so on, and suppose the temperature is gonna change by 10 degrees centigrade in the course of, say, two or three generations. How far would you have to walk to get to the temperature which you're used to? Well, if you're in Africa, which probably we all were at that time, and you lived in Cape Town, how far would you have to go? Mombasa. You all know where Mombasa is, right? It's a long way. Uh, that, I mean, literally, that's how far you'd have to go. That's why what Chris Bohm said is probably right. A lot of groups were moving up and down, uh, finding places to live, and undoubtedly finding each other in the way. Uh, this beautiful map, for which I thank the fantastic staff of the SFI for uh, putting together, uh, this tells you something about the evidence that I'll now put before you. I wanted to figure out, uh, were the groups genetically different enough? Uh, and um, was warfare common enough? These square things here are archaeological sites. Uh, these two here and that one there being extremely interesting. This one here, by the way, you just read about. This is uh, Gobero. Uh, it was uh, in the New York Times about two weeks ago. So I mean, the things are everything is changing. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic site. So far, 35 uh, remains have been uh, studied. Um, so these are archaeological sites where we study things like the ulna and and uh, 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 stone points in bones. These are uh, ethnographic studies of the Aceh before contact, uh, the Arrow and so on, Hiwi. Um, so those are all based on essentially uh, recent accounts. These lines without any dots are where I got the genetic data from. For example, from the Kung, from a lot of groups in Southern Africa, from uh, 14 groups of uh, Aboriginal Australians, these are two other groups and so on. These are, uh, some, th these are some, some fantastic studies done by uh, uh, geneticists in the uh, ex-Soviet um, Union uh, and, and more recently done by U.S. teams also. Uh, now, if you, if you look at the ethnographic evidence, these are ones which are not so relevant to us because of some problems with the data. Uh, there's always a problem if you find somebody studying how many people died in a war. It, quite, it's, it may be that the people were interested in that society because they're interested in war. So there is a selection problem in these data. Uh, and, uh, but these are, uh, these are, this says that among the Ache in the pre-contact period, 37% uh, of all deaths were because of conflicts. That's an extraordinary fraction. Uh, uh, if I had to choose which of these were kind of my best Estimates, having very carefully read all the dissertations and so on that these are based on, I think maybe uh, the Hiwi, the uh, Mergen, and the Bolivian Paraguayan groups are kind of in the ballpark. Uh, but let's see what we have here. Okay, maybe it's you know something like 18 percent. Um, does anybody know what fraction of Europeans died during the previous century, the century of total war? probably one-fourth of that, uh, or a little less, actually. Uh, it, surprisingly, I'm, I'm including civilians, of course, and a, lo a lot of these don't include uh, civilians, although the kinds of warfare that are going on 
Uh, a lot of this doesn't include the deaths from displacement, and those are included in the First and Second World War deaths. So our ancestors were a lot, a lot more bellicose in terms of the mortality consequences. Um, now, the archaeological evidence is interesting. It's basically, it's based on um, points, stone or uh, other kinds of uh, uh, points of weapons. Uh, the, uh, those two little dots in the Sudan, uh, the, uh, there were 58 skeletons. Da these were dating from the pre-agricultural period, uh, quite a bit before it. They were probably mammal hunters and fishers. And it looks like what happens was, was with the uh, in, uh, uh, de deterioration in the weather, a group which had been somewhere else encroached on their very nice fishing site on the, on the Nile uh, and eliminated them. You, you know that because of, uh, well, here's what the archaeologists said. Violence must have been a very common event in, in Nubia at this time, if we consider this graveyard as typical. There appears to be no significant distinction between males, females, and children in their exposure to violent death. Evidently, all members of the group were involved in conflict, not just the adult males. Uh, and um, uh, the um, individual on the left had uh, 19 stone points embedded uh, or associated with, it, with his uh, skeleton. Now, here again, there's some biases. A lot of the studies count it as death because of an arrow uh, or a spear, uh, if you, there's a point in the bone. Uh, now, there are a lot of ways to die without getting an arrow point in your bone. In fact, US, uh, our army surgeon studying the wounds of US um, soldiers in the Indian Wars found that uh, most of the arrow wounds, uh, and most of them were fatal, by the way, most of the arrow wounds did not uh, make any marks on the bones. So we would have lost, I mean, so these estimates could be way off. They could be way low because of all the wounds to the throat and the stomach, for example. Uh, now, not to mention uh, all the wounds to the head, uh, impact wounds. There's a lot of evidence in these. Uh, I'm really going on and on about this. You can, uh, come on. Uh, I, I got really fascinated at just sleuthing out what you can tell about these burials. But let's go on. Uh, the, um, oh, there's another one. That hole, that hole shouldn't be there. I mean, if, if you have a hole like that, in, you, know, uh, you should go get a new one. It's easy to get a new one now. Uh, the... Um, uh, so th these are the evidence for the archaeological data, and you'll see that there, it's, I mean, I was very surprised. There's no particular reason why the archaeological data with its biases should be similar to the ethnographic data and its biases, but they're, they're really quite similar. By the way, this last one here, Gobero, that's the most recent one. It's a very good study. Zero, zero, zero. That is, there are 35 uh, individuals there. There's not a sign of violence at all. I'm, of course, in correspondence with, there are to a total of two, more than 200, and I'm just dying for them to do the other rest of the analysis on the others because uh, it really is quite unusual in these studies to find no deaths by violence at all. Uh, uh, now, uh, oh, by the way, you can ask, well, what about murders? You know, well, we, we're we try to get evidence of things which have to do with these skirmishes. So when you find two or three people being buried at the same time uh, as they were in that Nubian site, that's a pretty good piece of evidence, uh, particularly if they also have points embedded in them and so on. But you really can't tell. Um, now, how different were these groups one from another? Uh, we, we can't tell, obviously, but what we can do is we can look at groups which are probably demographically, sociologically, and e economically similar, that is, foragers at the middle of the last century, some of them contacted, uh, some of them from whom blood was taken almost at contact, as, for example, in uh, this group here in Australia, I mean, the, con the, the contact <laughs> was with some people who said, oh, by the way, how about some blood? You know, uh, they must have thought these white people were really odd. Uh, but um, now, this is interesting though. Look at this, is a, this Aust Australian group. That has, a, this is how different they are. That, this is the conditional probability of differences between the group, these, these Fs or that. And this is uh, 0.081. Well, notice first, that's four times what Sewell Wright thought it was, and that's about the average of this. But what's remarkable about this is these two islands on which these people live are in sight of each other. Uh, they had some uh, um, exchange amongst them, and they both visited the mainland. They, they had ways of getting back and forth. Uh, and yet, they're genetically as different, these two islands are, as the major so-called races, or what should be called ancestral groups of the world. Uh, and you see the same thing in the Siberian groups. Adjacent groups 
are as different as Siberian peoples are from, say, North American, so-called Native, Native American peoples. Uh, so there are some processes which we don't fully understand which are making groups very different. Now, I can tell you what I think they are. I mean, the, 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 the migration among groups is non-random. Uh, there's a, a very uh, a boom and crash dynamic in the population which creates the same, uh, the effect of a very small group and so on, and that tends to make them more different. But so far, what we, I think the facts of the matter are that the groups are genetically a lot more different than those who put group selection in the doghouse thought. Um, what I gather from this is if you just take the central tendencies of the genetic data and of the warfare data and you put it together with the assumption that if groups with more altruists are proportionally more likely to survive, then you find that a very costly kind of altruism could, uh, could be proliferated by this uh, process. In other words, group selection would be a powerful force among uh, these people. But I keep putting off the big question. Why is warfare so common? To do this, we have to play artificial history. Uh, these are uh, Aboriginal Australians. I, I love this picture because notice as they are decorated, they're not likely to be mistaken by the guys on the other hill over there as people who are like them. That is, hum humans at an early stage began to decorate them ourselves and also are to make certain kinds of tools and artifacts which were distinct. Uh, now, this is, a, this is basically how the model works. And um, I don't expect you, I'm not going to work, go through the whole thing, but I, it'll, it'll help to see what's really going on. Uh, two groups meet. They're randomly paired, they meet. Well, the interaction can be hostile, it can be hostile or non-hostile. If, it's, if, it's ho if there are a lot of parochials in one group, it's going to be hostile. It doesn't have to be both, just even one will do it. So if it's non-hostile, then they don't have a war, they don't do anything, they just get the payoffs uh, that I described before, in which NT, not altruistic tolerant, is the dominant strategy. Now, they can have a hostile interaction, but like many animals, humans, when they're evenly matched, have a tendency to back off. So, they may not have a war, but if there is a big difference between how many fighters, that's parochial altruists there are in the two groups, they have a war, then the stronger one one is stronger and one is weaker, and the probability the stronger one wins depends on how many fighters they have. Now, this guy who wins, he loses some fighters, uh, but he takes over the, a part of the site of the losers. The losers, meanwhile, they lose some fighters and they lose a bunch of civilians, and these civilians over here, all, all of these guys who are dead over here, are then replaced by this group here. So, the the groups that lose a large number, that is the losers in these war, they're repopulated by couples randomly selected from the dominant group uh, to go, and, and, and so they have extra reproductive possibilities. Of course, you immediately thought, well, what about if the fighters from the winning group raped the surviving women of the losing group? That's another scenario. We've also simulated that. I, I'd be very happy to talk about that. It's, the, the results are remarkably similar, actually. And here's what you get when you have this coevolutionary process. This is a picture of some runs. Uh, we're looking here at the outbreak of war. Uh, here we have, here's the fraction of parochials, uh, and here's the fraction of altruists. This dark line is the parochial altruist. And you're going along here, and there's very few parochial altruists. You can match this vertically. This is the same run. That is, notice that these are the same years here. So this is the fraction, this is the fr frequency of wars. Well, wars aren't happening because there are very few parochials in the population. Uh, and so, and because there are very few wars happening, obviously the altruists aren't doing very well either because the only way they can win is by winning a war. Uh, so you're bumping along here, not having many wars, and then by chance, you get this uptick in the number of parochial altruists, uh, and that gives you an uptick in the number of wars, and then you go on for a long period of time here with a lot of wars, and then you go along, here you have a lot of parochial altruists. Notice here it almost crashed, and that could have crashed the wars and you could have gone back down, or it could have gone for how, however long. And here you have the outbreak of peace. Wars here are very frequent. It's sustaining this world in which the parochial altruists are doing well. Because there are a lot of parochial altruists, you have a lot of wars. Uh, and then there is a crash here. I don't think we should call it a crash though, right? We should call it 
a wonderful peace broke out, and, uh, and then, you, um, then, then you get down here and you have basically very few wars. So that's, uh, you see these transitions that take place. Uh, now, th it's an interesting question. Uh, am I imagining that you have societies moving back and forth between parochialism, altruism, and you know, selfish tolerance, or am I talking about a transition from a kind of an animal or a kind of an early human who was tolerant and uh, non-altruistic, and then the whole, uh, or a very large group, came and re became an, and, um, and remained so? Uh, uh, that's an interesting question, but I want to first show you um, what we can do here. Uh, as you probably figured out from looking at those uh, lines, you're very likely to have, see, th this is what's called the state space. This is all the combinations of parochials and altruists that you can have in the population. So here, you have zero altruists, and you also have zero parochialists. So we measure parochialism on this dimension and altruism here. So these, this skyscraper here says, the height of the skyscraper is the fraction of a very long period in which the population spends at that pair. So, for example, this would be 10% 10, 10 altruists and no parochials, and that's some percent of the time. Uh, and so basically, there are two ways to be in this world. You can be a society of parochial altruists, and you can be a society, sorry, a society here of parochial altruists with very frequent wars, or tolerant non-altruists. And those of you who like to think about these things can see that there, right around here is something called a saddle point. It slopes down in this direction and up in that direction. Uh, and um, so what's interesting is, well, can we actually observe these transitions? Let me see if I can show. My mouse doesn't seem to be working, but fortunately, I never go anywhere without many mice. Uh, okay, try me. Um, now, by the way, this is the thing I said you can do, but uh, don't worry about the, the, the addiction problem. Uh, over here, you're going to see, this is the state space. That's the fraction of altruists. That's that dimension. That's the fraction of parochials. That's that dimension. And what you're going to see here is a history. You're going to see the fractions in the population, just like the, the lines that I showed you, um, as they move along. So here's how, uh, and just for fun, I'm going to start it off down here somewhere. And then each dot is one period in which the population has that particular distribution. And what you should be looking for, it, well, one thing it's going to be, it'll astound you. This thing moves around a lot. What we, in, in the business, what we say is, the surface is pretty flat. So whatever selection is doing, it's not riveting you on one spot. There's a lot of motion. But at a certain point, you'll find an excursion. And it'll end up up there. So keep, you have to watch it, because it, you know, compared to how much time it spends where the skyscrapers are, it, 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 it passes over the saddle. Uh, really, really quickly. So you got to pay attention. OK, wait. Uh, how about slow? Well, OK, here's, here's what's going on so far. It's moving around uh, in this territory here, which is the non-altruistic and tolerant part. Uh, and here we have very few parochial altruists. Obviously, you cannot infer how many parochial altruists there are from knowing how many, how many uh, altruists and how many parochials there are, because they could be disjoint or they could be all together, but um, unless, of course, there's 100% of each. But let me continue this. I'll do it slower. Um, and there's a lot of action there, uh, but, whoa, uh, you're probably going to get a movement up to the upper corner now. So That'll stay up there for a while. So basically, we've made a transition from this uh, tolerant altruistic to this uh, parochial altruistic. Uh, and now you see the, the gray line is the parochial altruist. Almost crashed here. Could have come back down there. Uh, and it just moves back and forth. Now, when I said that I've run 50, uh, 5 million of these, that's a fact. Uh, well, 5 million in one. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not recording this one. 
after a while, you can't really see what's going on because the dots are on top of each other. One thing I want to say about this method is that um, uh, what you saw, no one has ever seen before. I'm not giving you something that was canned there. I ran something that will never be seen again, it's never be seen, it's been seen before. Why? Because there's so many stochastic processes going on, the mutation process, who meets whom, and so on. So what you do is you run this thing over and over again. It's a lot of discussion in our, in our trade about, well, how many times do you have to run it before you think you understand it? Um, uh, okay. Um, you remember that I introduced my friends at the end of the last um, uh, meeting. I think that, um, here's what I think is true on the basis of what I've found out so far. Under conditions approximating those experienced by our late Pleistocene ancestors, groups of parochial altruists could have emerged and such groups would have uh, provoked, engaged in, and won wars with other groups. And independent of any initial conditions, what would have occurred uh, is that altruism and parochialism would be uh, non-viable separately, uh, but they could have evolved co-evolved jointly with warfare. Now, oh, I should have put the reister here. This is a really speculative point. One of the most wonderful puzzles is this. What is the most likely scenario that explains why we're all here tonight is that a small group, perhaps numbering a few hundred, probably in the northern Rift Valley, north of Nairobi, uh, um, they expanded out of that territory, uh, and then they spread around the shores of the Indian Ocean. Uh, starting at about 60,000 years ago, they, they reached Australia probably in 15,000 years, which is unbelievably fast, uh, having, of course, remained in Africa for a long period of time, probably having remained in Africa with a lot of modern attributes, um, and eventually, of course, also moving into Europe, uh, and. Um, uh, outcompeting the Neanderthals. Um, now, uh, isn't it remarkable that this small group could be the ancestors of all of us? And don't you wonder, well, what did they have, or what had they become, or what could they do that the other groups that they were competing with couldn't do, or didn't do, or hadn't yet learned how to do? I'm not just talking about the Neanderthals, I'm talking about all of the other hominids who they encountered, including other humans. Well. A possibility which I think is, there's no evidence against it, and it's a very plausible story, and there are some other alternative explanations that also are plausible. This is one I'd like us to think about. Cooperation, cooperation against others may be a, the distinctive capacity of our ancestors that explains their success, our success, in the great exodus from Africa 60,000 years ago. Now, um, there is no evidence that there's any genetic basis for war, or for altruism, or for racism, or anything of the kind. Uh, we may get that evidence. I, I hope we are able to explore the evidence for whether there is any kind of genetic foundations or, uh, of, of these behaviors. We don't know that now. Uh, all that this shows is that if alleles, plural, almost certainly, supporting these, act, these behaviors were to exist, they might have evolved in the way that I said. Um, the important point is that if a parochial form of altruism is our legacy, genetic or cultural, if I'm right in that, it need not be our fate. That is up to us. We are uniquely a cultural species in the sense that our cultural capacities surpass all others, and we're able to invent, to redirect, to overcome outsider hostility through socialization and exposure. Um, I am encouraged um, by what we're finding out in experiments. I, I mentioned last night some experiments in which people favored insiders over outsiders. And there's a big literature, it's called the minimal group experiment literature, in which they ask people, do you like this painting or that painting? It's usually Clay and Kandinsky. And then they put them into the Clay group and the Kandinsky group, and sure enough, they get to hate each other, and uh, the Kandinsky people will give more money to their group, and so on. Well, uh, some years back, uh, a frequent visitor to the Santa Fe Institute, Toshio Yamagishi, who was deeply suspicious of this, he designed an experiment 
to get at his hunch. And his hunch was that the clay people thought that by giving more to the clay group, they would get more back from the clay group. That is, they had sort of thought that this would be reciprocated. So he designed an experiment in which everybody got paid before they made their decision about which group they would give to. They already got their little envelope with their whatever, whatever they're going to get. They said, oh, one last thing, could you make this allocation? And this has been re reproduced a number of times. They allocated absolutely equally, uh, absolutely equally. Uh, this is true among Japanese people, Australian people. Uh, now, what's really interesting about this is that when, when you got rid of the idea that your group is going to treat you better if you treat them better by separating that out, people had no particular reason to give to the Kandinsky people less than to their own clay people. But it's better than that. The people who were the clay people, they asked them, they debriefed them, well, what do you think about the Kandinsky people? They had bad attitudes about the Kandinsky people, just the way they always do in all these experiments. They asked, you know, would you rate how good, how their good looks? Would you rate how you think they are as people, and so on? And the group business worked. They really came to not like the other people, but they didn't see any reason to give them less money. Isn't that inspiring? I mean, <laughs> I mean, that, you know, I mean, it does mean, you know, you can have bad attitudes and still be a just person. Uh, I find that really remarkable. Now, a, um, uh, a student and co-author of mine also did a remarkable experiment with real money, real big-time money, uh, in which she showed people pictures of the victims of Katrina. And the, the, uh, the manipulations were very clever. In some cases, you saw people, a, a very sort of shack-like house, which was a tree fallen on it. In some cases, you saw a rather nice house, you know, and a tree had fallen in the swimming pool or something. And um, in some cases, it was obvious, because the people who were in the picture, there were uh, African-American people, and in some cases, there were white people. And so then, given these various treatments about who they're giving to, they then had to give real money. Actually, they're giving a lot of money. That is, the experimenter gave them $100 and said, which communities would you like to give to? Uh, I didn't guess the answer. They were extremely sensitive to whether it was a shack or a swimming pool. They gave to the poor people. And there was no race effect at all. These are all white uh, experimental subjects. They didn't pay attention to race. Now, if you look carefully, there were some people who paid a lot of attention to race. Some positively, some negatively. But the average was none at all. But, so, I'm not pessimistic that we can overcome the parochial aspects of our heritage. And I want to close with the following, to me, inspiring story of a retired Tamil schoolmaster boarding a train in Kandy, in Sri Lanka, during the 1977 anti-Tamil riots, where the Sinhalese people were murdering systematically Tamil people in their presence. He was unlikely to be mistaken for a Sinhala, as he was dark in complexion. As he boarded the 315 upcountry bound train from Kandy. I don't know, Kandy's in the center of Sri Lanka. He chose one of those old red train cars with two long wooden benches. One with its back against the window and the other across from it facing the outside. The only other passenger in his compartment was a Kandyan Sinhala woman. She was a typical, and now that's a description by the person. Now he's quoting himself, the uh, Mr. Emmanuel. She was a typical Kandian Sinhalese with a sari worn in the Kandian way. He goes on and describes her jewelry. She was obviously Sinhalese. She was seated on the window seat. I sat on the bench against the wall away from the door. She could have been the mother of any of those many Sinhala boys and girls I had taught for 50 years. I knew the riots had started in Kandy Town. I was hearing the thugs shout in Sinhala, get the Tamils, kill them. I didn't look. I could hear the passengers being pulled out of the train and beaten. There was lots of screaming, rioting, cheering. Then I heard screaming in the very compartment behind ours. And then the door opened and the thugs were climbing the steps into our compartment. And this woman suddenly gets up and she comes and sits next to me. I have my hands on my legs to stop them from shaking. She puts her hand on my left hand. She doesn't say a word. I don't say a word. The mob comes in and they stick their heads in the window. There are three guys in front of us and they look at us and they turn and say, there are no Tamils here. 
and they go on to the next car, from which there are more screams. A few minutes later, the train pulled out of the station. Tamil passengers from the train were still being chased and beaten and stabbed. This woman did not let my hand go until we reached Gampala 35 minutes later. She didn't say a word, not a single word. I didn't say anything, I couldn't. Life passed through my head like a reel. All the school children, the teachers, all the Sinhala parents and their kids, the sports meets, all the cricket games and the prize givings, like a reel. At Gampala, she got off the train. She didn't even look at me. I don't even know her name. So there's hope. Thank you very much. I did want to say something about what we're doing tomorrow. Uh, so I, I was so moved by that story that I forgot. Um, what I'd like to say is this. I, I think so far, to my satisfaction, I've established that we are uniquely cooperative in the ways we cooperate. Our cooperative nature can't be explained by self-interest. Part of the explanation is that we are altruistic some of the time, and today I think I've established that we could have evolved by a co-evolution of, as I say, warfare, parochialism, and altruism. Tomorrow, we have a much harder job. Tomorrow, I want to ask you to think about this. How can this knowledge improve the way we govern our local, national, and global interactions to provide a flourishing and sustainable life for all humans? I will use experiments, I'll use some economic theory, and I'll try to think what we could do to make this world better for every human being on the basis of what we have learned. Uh, there are no easy answers, and I want you to go home thinking about the following. I'll begin tomorrow with the following experiment. It's actually real life, it was an experiment. In Haifa, in Israel, parents, as around the world, came late to pick up their kids at a daycare center. There was actually a string of daycare centers, there were 16 of them. Uh, and the teachers, of course, being somewhat inconvenienced by this, decided that they would post a fine for people coming late. But they cleverly did this in some of the schools, but not others. They wanted to see what the effect was. Uh, and so, on Thursday and Friday, there was a sign on the door. It didn't say any reasons, because by this time, an experimental economist had got involved. Probably he was a parent of one of the kids. He said, listen, let's not say why. Let's just say there's going to be a fine. We don't want to bias this experiment. So it just said, from Monday, if you pick up your kids late, you'll pay the following fine. And they did this in 10 of the schools, and they didn't do it in six of the schools. Okay? And then, they had recorded how many people were coming late the previous five weeks. And then they recorded how many people we're going, to come late, uh, we're going to come late in the next, uh, throughout the whole experiment. It went on for 17 weeks. I'm not going to tell you what happened, but what happened will educate us a lot about how there are no easy answers in making this world a better place to live in, but I think we can do it. Thank you very much. I, I notice I've gone on for a long time. I think I got too involved in that story about the Tamil man. Uh, but uh, I'm happy to take comments and, and suggestions. Com yes? Well, I, I just wanted to mention... Um, Why don't you stand up and turn around? Because uh, yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to say, you know, obviously uh, what we should aim for, perhaps, is the altruistic tolerance mm -hmm. you know, scenario. Yeah. Um, first, I think the first thing you said is absolutely right. Notice, I, I was, what was happening is you were going from the, the tolerant, non-altruistic part of the state space to the uh, uh, altruistic and parochial part. Well, why not the tolerant and uh, altruistic part? Is there a scenario by which humans could have become that way? Or maybe we are more that way than I have stressed, and I'm just being pessimistic. Yes, there is a way. Here's how it could have happened. Remember the weather data? Tremendous environmental crises. Well, now, uh, suppose that you, there's an environmental crisis and the groups with more altruists survive the crisis. And some other groups go extinct, not because of warfare, 
but just they couldn't cooperate when they, when they had to relocate. That would have vacated a site. So this whole process could work without the actual conflict between groups. Rather, it could be the interactions of groups with this extremely volatile natural environment uh, in which the cooperative groups would win, and they wouldn't have to be parochial in order to win. Now, so why didn't I tell you that story? I didn't tell you that story because I think the evidence is overwhelming that our ancestors were warlike. But it doesn't mean that the warlike aspect explains the whole thing. It just means that's what we have evidence for. I don't know how to test the more hopeful hypothesis that it could have been really more of a combination of these things leading us, in some ways, to the other corner of the state space in which we are uh, altruistic and tolerant. I think it's a fantastic idea. Now, about gender, um, I th uh, gender is important both in how you actually construct these models, but do uh, the sexes come out differently in terms of their behavior? Uh, I haven't modeled that in, this, uh, in any of these uh, works, except, as I say, I, I did model the, um, the rape scenario in the conflict between groups. Um, the one thing I think is quite remarkable and very surprising is that in the experiments, of which there are a lot of different kinds of experiments, there may be, may be five or six that are, the, you know, that are done everywhere, and hundreds of them have been done, what I find remarkable is how similar men and women are in these experiments. There are some systematic differences about risk-taking, for example. But in terms of things like how much you give in the ultimatum game and cooperation and so on, the, the differences are, there, is, there really are not systematic differences. I find that surprising because I was asked last night, do I think that people's values and preferences are shaped by their experiences? And I said, absolutely. And I claimed that that's something I work on and believe in. Well, what could be a bigger difference than being a man and a woman in the world in terms of the likely kinds of experiences that you have? Today, of course, but also in the past. So this is a big puzzle. Now, we, maybe we haven't studied enough what the differences are. Maybe we haven't devised experiments which would bring out the differences. So I, I suspect that the hypothesis behind your question is right, and we haven't designed experiments to particularly study that because the experimenters so far have not been very interested in it. But there are, now, that, now there's some very good experimenters working on that. We'll know more five years from now. Yes? Um, well, I think the big lesson about ethnic hostility is that hostilities which are said to date from primordial times were often invented a decade ago. Uh, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not just talking, I mean, I can tell you examples of this in which you have societies, m members of people living together, intermarrying, uh, doing common uh, activities, and then everything blows up. And everybody says, oh yeah, but it blows up, but it was like simmering below the surface beforehand. Uh, well, I mean, there were not behavioral aspects of that, and the simmering below the surface is what people uh, who don't believe that ethnic hostility and also ethnic solidarity can be created in short periods of time. Now, f I am extremely uh, optimistic in that respect because in the short space of half a century, racial attitudes in America have radically changed. Uh, I put a picture of my hero, Rosa Parks, uh, on the screen, but there are plenty of other examples uh, too prominent to name tonight. Um, and uh, so I, there, there are lots of examples of overcoming these things and creating them. Uh, and it's something on which I'm, uh, you know, we know a lot about that. People are extremely susceptible to example in overcoming racial prejudices. Um, and uh, I mean, even, we even have sort of uh, neuroscientific evidence about fear of different people, p fear of other races, white people's fear of African Americans, for example, but not Denzel Washington, right? Uh, I mean, on a, honestly, that all you have to show is a familiar face 
and then there's a very, very different reaction. So I think we're talking about something that, can I say it, is skin deep. Uh, it's very powerful, but it also is very vulnerable to a systematic and dedicated attempt to eradicate it, and I think we can do that. Yeah? Uh, altruism came first. Um, the, I mean, I, it's unimaginable that when humans uh, began to target large game, uh, they, uh, that they hadn't already begun some kind of altruistic sentiments. Uh, because it's not that you can't catch a large game without cooperating, it's that it's not, there's no point in it uh, unless you're a large group that's figured out some way to share. So I suspect that the rudiments of cooperative activity among humans, some of which was, co was altruistic, some of which was self-interested, I think that's a, probably a fairly old thing in, the, in humans. Uh, now, by, if, by religion, you mean beliefs about the supernatural and the afterlifes and things like that. Of course, we don't know in the distant past, but we do know a fair amount about uh, the religious attitudes and things like burial practices associated with belief in the afterlife and so on among um, uh, foraging groups that are called immediate return groups. Immediate return foraging groups, they don't save and they, don't, uh, they, they, they think very little about the relationship between the present and the future because they don't save. Uh, they typically dispose of uh, the dead uh, simply as they would dis dispose of any carcass of any other animal and they typically don't have views about the afterlife. Now, when I say typically, I mean the studies are limited in the sense that there aren't that many that have been studied, but if the immediate return type of foraging group were our distant ancestors, I think it's quite unlikely that we had anything that we would call religion amongst them, but quite likely that there was some kind of altruistic uh, conscience uh, among these, uh, these people. Uh, say, Chris, what do you think about that? Thanks. Yeah, right there. Yeah, uh, there's nothing in this story that has to be genetic. The reason why I did it as a genetic story is because uh, I think people rightly say that uh, the culturally, um, uh, it's pretty easy to see how this could happen culturally. Uh, it's much harder to see how it could happen genetically. I, I did a genetic model, or it's actually quite a rudimentary genetic model, but there is vertical transmission and there's recombination and all the sort of standard stuff. Uh, I did that because it was harder, uh, because I thought a fortiori I could probably do the cultural. Uh, now, that may be mistaken to think that I think these things are all um, genetic, which I don't. As I, and that's why I emphasize so strongly, we really don't know the, about the genetics of the behaviors I'm talking about. Yes, sir. We have a perfect example before us, a curious person. Then the curiosity enters picture. <laughs> well, that I don't know, but I can tell you this, that if you make your living as a hunter-gatherer, you're probably a very cognitively advanced and creative person. A lot more probably than a typical individual citizen of a modern uh, economy. The intellectual demands of knowing a hundred or more animals and a hundred or more plants and where to find them when, and uh, that way of making your living is cognitively extraordinarily demanding. Those people must have been curious about finding that information and transmitting it. Uh, so I would expect that curiosity may have been around for a long time because our, our foraging ancestors really had a lot harder time cognitively making a living than most people do in America today. Yeah. In a lot of the simulations um, in the epigraphs there, we're talking about egalitarian societies and where the social hierarchy, he introduced a variable of hierarchy where you have institutionalized hierarchies, it's perhaps a large number, uh, 
so if you're okay, okay is there, what does that then do with the, with the linear relationship between um, PAs and, and conflict across the board? Does that sort of population of coerced into conflict also increase, or is there similar to that? That's a great question, and I know it comes from a profound knowledge of this stuff, because that's <laughs> what you do. Uh, I'm studying a period during which we didn't have governments. Uh, it doesn't mean that we didn't have hierarchy, but we didn't have governments meaning a specialized group of people with coercive powers. Uh, that's almost all of human history, and that's the part that I'm studying. Now, it's, it's, it's very important that uh, sometime towards the end of my period, maybe 10,000 years ago to 5,000 years ago, you begin to get societies that have very pronounced leadership, centrality of networks and so on, uh, often with political influence and sometimes with or without economic uh, uh, advantages. That's really an interesting thing. Sometimes you get political power without the economic uh, privileges. Uh, that would make a difference here. Now, I mean, still, in most of the societies, uh, pre-state societies, you do not have the ability to coerce people to fight a war. In fact, being able to coerce people to fight a war has almost never been the case. You have to do, I mean, uh, uh, warrior groups that are coerced are obviously not very effective. It's a classic case of, because in the field you have a hard time disciplining people. Uh, so I, most, of, uh, most of warfare must have been to some extent voluntarily engaged in or otherwise the fighting force wouldn't have worked. Um, now, that isn't all of it. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of coercion within military organizations. Uh, right at the back. Yeah, they are. And um, that's, I mean, I, I've, at the, at the Institute for the past eight years, I've run a workshop called The Coevolution of Individual Behaviors and Institutions. Uh, because I want to see how these two different dynamic processes work. Um, a lot of people are studying that. Now, it's true that in some fields, uh, uh, people study only the institutions and treat them as if they were people. And in other fields, economics being one, you tend to study individuals and you ignore the institutions. But clearly, the way you ask the question, I mean, that's the right track. And uh, uh, everyone is trying to figure out what is a good way of combining an individual dynamic with a group level dynamic. The group selection models that I've put forward are one example, but they're by f there's many, many others. And uh, you know, obviously, this raises huge questions of scientific method. Should you start with the individuals and see if you can create the institutions out of them? Or should you start with the institutions and see what kinds of people would result if they were living under those institutions? And I answer, you should do both, obviously. And that's, that's why we have this rather demanding process of trying to look at the way that the aggregates and the individuals interact, but not in any simple way of moving by addition from one to the other. Um, and, and that's why, as I say, theorem-based Mathematical reasoning is very limited in its capacity to do this. Uh, what we really lack, by the way, is historical, sociological, psychological insight. Um, the problem is not really modeling it. The problem is getting good ideas. Last question. I'm very sorry. I appreciate very much these questions. Yeah. Well, it's, hard, you know, it's, it's obviously hard to say what are, what are causing these things. Obviously, religions have these various aspects. I mean, there is an Old Testament and a New Testament aspect of all of this. There's the eye for the eye, uh, and there's also turning the other cheek. Now, what's interesting is that contrary to my model and contrary to my simulations, turning the other cheek has actually gotten a, a pretty big success in the world as an ideology, as a, as a morality that people have followed. Um, and I mean, that's, I mean, we're really looking at this contrast Old and New Testament kind of reasoning. Uh, and I find it, um, uh, to tell you the truth, in the models that I do, turning the other cheek is often not a good strategy. Um, and it was that I can explain why reciprocity would become a very, very prominent trait among humans. Uh, I can understand that. I can also, but uh, the, the simply unconditional help everybody, no matter what they do to you, strikes me as something which really would have a limited uh, capacity to evolve. However, I've, I find it very inspiring, and, and the people that I see it, like Mother Teresa. 
Thank you very much for your comments. I'll see you tomorrow.